You know, I think one of the things that's common in, you know, every entrepreneurial journey is that there are ups and downs and you got to be able to bounce off the, the downs and, and get back on the on the ups as quickly as you can. You know, here is an idea. Um, we can achieve this together. The thing about failure is that you have to be in the environment that is supportive of you experimenting and trying things. From CMC Markets, this is The Artful Trader. And there are lots of opportunities. 100 point swing on the Dow. And then we're going to get answers, and then you have an opportunity to change it. Is it something that was wrong in the process, or is it something that we didn't follow that the process told us? Hello and welcome to The Artful Trader. I'm Michael McCarthy, Chief Market Strategist at CMC Markets Asia Pacific. In our third season, we talk to the experts in their own fields to uncover what gives them the confidence to succeed. We uncover confidence, unlocking the secrets behind resilience, preparation and growth and how it can make you a better trader. It's not often you sit in a room with three people that have had the confidence to disrupt industries, to disrupt people and the way they view the world, to even disrupt their own ways of thinking. In this first of a two-part Disruptor special, we're speaking to three CEOs about their journeys to startup success. Stay with us as we speak to Tim Fung from Airtasker, Oleg Vornik from Drone Shield, and Drew Bilby from Nextbar about how they've used their confidence to overturn industries. Tim Fung, founder and CEO of Airtasker, welcome to the Artful Trader. Thanks for having me. Tim, were there early life experiences that fostered your entrepreneurial spirit? When I was a young kid, I used to, um, you know, when I put my mind to something, I'd usually try and, you know, go out and get it. And I'd go to various lengths to, to be able to get what I wanted. So I remember, you know, there'd be like some specific action figure that I would want. And I would actually go and look through the yellow pages, call up, you know, the 20 toy stores. And then, you know, um, ask my mom to go and drive me out to that toy store. And it was really like specific. That was probably like one of the early experiences. And then I remember when I was young, my dad used to pay me a couple of cents to pluck out um, each of his grey hairs. So he'd, uh, he'd sit in front of the TV and I'd sit behind him pulling out his grey hairs. And usually he'd pay me two or three cents per hair that I pulled out. Yeah. But I, I remember once he, he offered me um, 10 cents per hair. Um, oh. And then he actually fell asleep in front of the TV. And uh, I ended up picking 250 hairs out of his head um, <laughs> and getting $25, which for a 10-year-old was like an incredible amount of money. And I was um, super excited. So I guess that was one of my first entrepreneurial Okay, so you had a lot of determination, obviously. And when you saw an opportunity, you were prepared to take it. Yeah, yeah. Various <laughs> of various uh, nature. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> Outstanding. Before you moved into Airtask, you worked in various places, including at Macquarie Bank. Um, you came there straight from university, I believe. How did that uh, inform your approach to the startup world? Well, one thing is that I think it's really good to get a basis of learning in a really high performance organization. So I think Macquarie was a great learning ground for, for getting the basics right. And some of these things I think um, we might take for granted, like you know being able to write an email, set up a, um, set up a meeting, um, you know all of these things that seem to be um, seem to be basic. Um, and I remember when I was at Macquarie, there were little things like typos, like, um, you know, sending an email out without checking uh, your spelling and, and rechecking your spelling. And, and they're all just um, basic things that I think were a really good foundation for uh, later moments of my career. And you were also a founding team member and an investor at Amazim. Yeah. So um, in 2009, so I was at Macquarie from 2004 to 2009. And, and after that... Um, I was watching a lot of the show Entourage, and I wanted to be um, like Ari Gold, the uh, you know the Hollywood uh, agent. So yes. I went out and tried to apply to work in a few talent representation agencies. Oh, okay. um, so I actually made like this really embarrassing uh, now uh, color brochure about myself, and I sent it to all of the talent repping agencies in Australia. And I was really lucky; I got picked up um, by an agency called Chic Management, which is uh, run by quite a famous model scout um, called Ursula Hufnagel. So I went there I started working for her for free doing a whole lot of PowerPoint presentations because I was really good at that from my days in investment banking right and it was actually her partner in the modeling agency happened to be a really senior telco executive and entrepreneur uh, and he offered me the opportunity to work with him on on building um, a mobile startup which was amazing what personal characteristic has been the biggest asset to you in building Airtasker my wife tells me that uh one of my uh, greatest strengths is probably that I can, you know, take a beating, get up and, and go do it again. So, you know, I think one of the things about um, that's common in, you know, every entrepreneurial journey is that there are ups and downs. 
and you've got to be able to bounce off the, the downs and, and get back on the on the ups as quickly as you can. I guess it's a combination of, of confidence and chutzpah to, um, to, to keep going. So, yeah, I don't yeah. think there's any specific skill around, like, numeracy or speaking or, or language or anything like that. It's just... Um, I think um, I'm I'm willing to put in the grit and um, put in the effort. So we've spoken with all kinds of disruptors in this series, Tim, but when you started up Airtasker, there wasn't an existing industry to disrupt. Instead, you changed the way people thought about local services. What were the challenges in bringing that to, to bear? Well, I actually think, um, so it's quite interesting, the parallels between something like a Mason, which was a, a more, I guess, traditional challenger opportunity. You know, we were looking at, Telstra had a certain amount of market share in, in mobile sims and so did Optus and we were coming in to, um, you know, very specifically uh, create a simpler product with a lower price and, 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 and try to grab some market share doing that. Um, and you're right, with Airtasker, we weren't doing that. In fact, the biggest competitor that we had was really like apathy or jobs just not being done. You know, people thinking, oh, I've got those boxes over there that I really should be throwing out. Um, but I'm just not going to do that. I'm oh, very my... familiar with this. <laughs> I think everyone's sort of familiar with that. You know, the um, I guess the biggest competitor is the couch. You know, I could, I could just Look, sort of... you're giving my secrets away, <laughs> pal. Um, so I think that's everyone's secret. So that's right. why uh, that's probably why it's an interesting um, problem. But it did make it actually more difficult because you actually had to go out there and, in a way, frame the problem uh, for people, and then and then um, actually you know offer them the solution to being able to solve that problem. The way we went about doing that is by building Airtasker as a demand-driven open marketplace. And um, that's, I guess, I guess, a fancy way for saying, rather than us thinking about what do you need, like us thinking we're going to find cleaners and plumbers and electricians and carpenters, we actually started the platform out as simply an open box that said, what do you need done? And um, you could actually type anything into that box that you wanted. Um, and that was uh, a signaling for the customer to say, this is what I need. And the great thing about that is that because so many people have various different kinds of skills, um, they were able to go, oh, wow, someone's looking for that. I can do that. I've got the skills to be able to do that. Um, and that was a really different approach compared to what was traditionally done, which was, yeah, I, I do these things. This is all I'm offering. And if you know you don't need what I'm offering, then... Uh, nothing's going to happen. I've heard Airtasker described, and please tell me if this is unfair, as a dating site for services. Well, we have had a few um, love stories uh, <laughs> there on, the, on the platform. You know, we've had a few, um, yeah, there's been certainly romances. There's been a bunch of like wedding proposals. Um, so there's definitely some great stories um, that, that, um, that are happening there. And I guess, yeah, to a certain extent, it's a similar thing. It's somebody saying, hey, I, um, I need this service done or I need this problem solved. And another person saying, yep, I can do that. And it's about uh, matching the most relevant uh, people together to get that done in the, in the best possible way. And in the process, creating new industries, new opportunities and, and getting more done. For sure. I mean, you know, we have um, 30,000 um, active workers um, every month using the platform and, and they're earning close to $120 million a year uh, doing this kind of work. So it's something that sort of started out as, um, you know, a side hustle for a lot of people, but over time um, has been able to become a professionalized um, full time job. And what gave you confidence that this would work? Well, I think um, probably a moment of lapsed uh, thinking, uh, perhaps, and, I, and I, I say that jokingly, but also I think that there is some truth in that, which is that I think um, when you go and start a venture, if someone was to ask you to write a document laying out exactly what are the probabilistic chances of each step of the journey kind of working out, I'm almost certain that, you know, you would back right out and go, that's insane. Why would I go and do this? The chances of me being able to do something else and, and earn an income doing that are, are way, way higher. Um, so I, I do think to a certain extent, it's an irrational thing where you're like, I just want this to happen. It would be really, really cool if it happened. Um, so that's where it kind of started. Um, but I think throughout the journey, one thing that we found is that when we went out and we saw the taskers who were doing the, the jobs and earning an income doing it, and we heard about their stories, it really was quite inspiring. It was quite emotional, um, mm -hmm. actually. And, and that's the thing that really gets us um, out of bed now, the opportunity to create really good jobs for humans. Um, and I think, you know, in the age of things like AI um, coming and automation of, of jobs, like that's exciting stuff. We want that to happen. And we want um, a lot of these kinds of jobs to be, you know, automated and, and, and make progress in that way. Right. But on the other hand, we want humans to be able to find the next, what's the next thing that only humans can go and do. 
And I don't think there's any danger of there not being jobs for humans to do. Um, uh, you know, if you look a couple of hundred years ago in America, you know, 20% of the country was employed in agriculture and farming. And now it's only a very small percentage in agriculture and farming. But you know, there's new jobs, there's Snapchat marketer, there's AI data scientists, there's all these other kinds of jobs. So um, we're really excited about being able to create those opportunities for, for humans. Have you ever hired anyone off Airtasker? Of course. I, uh, <laughs> yep, I've got my cleaning subscription um, on Airtasker. So we've just uh, recently launched our um, subscription uh, product so that you can um, engage the same tasker to um, to come over and you know do your cleaning, your lawn mowing, um, things like that. So okay. I've got my cleaning on uh, autopilot with Airtasker. Right. Um, but I've also recently you know had a hole patched in my roof. I've had my air conditioning moved. I'd have my tiling done. Um, yeah, I, I use Airtasker a lot. I, I get some free credits though. <laughs> <laughs> Pleased to hear it. And, and I can see that there's a lot of satisfaction that comes from being able to see the changes that Airtasker has brought to people's lives. But you've described the first three to four years of it as quite gruelling. What kept you going through that? Well, I think there were a, there were a couple of things. Um, so I think definitely the inspiration of working with the people um, on the platform was an important part of it. Um, another part of it was that um, we raised money early on um, to build the Airtasker platform. Right. And, and we kind of had to do that because... It is definitely an, an infrastructure type business. You've got to kind of like lay out this network and invest this huge amount of money into building the platform, building all the communication, the payment system, all of this stuff. And, you know, when you're doing 20 jobs a day, you're bringing in about, you know, $15 of revenue a day or something. Right. You need to raise money to be able to, to do that and, and, and do it well. And right. so one thing was the responsibility that we'd taken on. I think me and my co-founder, Jono, both took that responsibility really, really seriously. Right. And... Um, yeah, I think that that was one thing. It was kind of felt like we jumped out of a plane, you know, and make a parachute. You got to figure this out um, or at least um, go down trying. Tim Fung, thank you very much for joining us on the Alpha Trader. Thanks so much for having me. Drew Bilby. CEO of Nexpar, welcome to the Artful Trader podcast series. Thanks for having me, Mike. Very pleased to be here. Drew, Nexpar went from an idea on a beach in Mexico to one of the leading brands in Australia. Can you tell me the story of Nexpar? Yeah, I can. It's um, how, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Short version, please. Right. right. Um, so, in a nutshell, I um, I was lucky enough to spend uh, about a year on exchange in Mexico whilst I was studying uh, my degree back here of civil engineering. Um, when I was over there, I, you know, as you do when you're in a different environment, you see things in a different light, and I really noticed that that um, you know the better for you beverage space was much more well developed in Mexico um, than it was in Australia. Uh, you know, I focused on the iced tea category at that point, and it was about one to two percent um, of the market back in Australia, but in Mexico it was about twelve to fourteen percent. So I saw, you know, a real opportunity to to come back to Australia, um, you know, start this your better for your beverage company, um, and really see, you know, and, and try and, um, you know, show Australian consumers what we can do and what we can drink that's better for you in Australia. So you found a gap <clears throat> in the market, but what made you confident that it would work in Australia? I think, you know, when you're uh, 22 um, and a little bit sort of uh, unfamiliar with the industry and, and a little bit naive, you can often see see things like that as just a real challenge and, and, and a real opportunity. Um, you know, absolutely throughout the process, we've, we've had huge speed humps and, and different things. But one of the things I did when I first came back to Australia was tap my brother-in-law, Troy Douglas, on the shoulder. Um, he wasn't your brother-in-law at that stage. No, he wasn't was my brother-in-law at that stage. Right. Um, we... Uh, yeah, so I tapped him on the shoulder and said, mate, look, I, I really believe in this opportunity. Um, we looked at it together and we agreed that it was a, a really big potential in Australia. Having that business partner to go through the whole entire process together really gives you that confidence. And, and it's it's basically a shoulder to lean on and, and, and a team to, to go into the process together. What was Troy's reaction when you told him your idea? Um, he's about as crazy as me. So he's uh, <laughs> fired up. He is um, super passionate about health and well-being. Right. Um, he's incredibly passionate about business, um, as we both are. So it was it was almost like um, you know we gave each other the, the strength and passion and motivation to jump on board together. Um, it, it really made us stronger as a team to to go into this and, and give us the confidence to think, you know, here is an idea. Um, we can achieve this together. Now, Drew, I've got to say, a lot of people say you should never work with family. But that wasn't the case for you. Well, as you mentioned, it wasn't family to start with. But, <laughs> okay. um, no, look, I think 
the biggest thing when when kind of looking at a business partner relationship is making sure that the person that you're partnering with has really contrasting and complementary skill sets to yourself. Right. One of the biggest things about Troy and I is that um, you know I'm I'm really passionate about um, the operational side of things, um, the running of the business, innovation, etc. Troy is really passionate about um, stakeholder management, the finance of the business, the marketing piece. So, given that we've got such different skill sets, it's really easy to kind of work on different things um, in a collaborative way, and and you know you find that you're clashing less. Whereas if I think if you if you get someone that's absolutely like minded to you and and wants to work on the same things, you're probably in for a bit of a tougher ride. So you'd started with a canning machine that that you bought sight unseen off eBay. We did. So the product we wanted to produce, there was no one in Australia that could produce it for us. So we jumped on Alibaba, which is kind of the um, the yeah. Chinese eBay, yep. and bought a a two thousand an hour canning line in a forty foot container. Um, you know, sight unseen, rocked up with, you know, no English writing on it. So we had to kind of muddle our way through putting that together. It took us about six months and finally got a machine um, or, you know, developed a factory in, in Hornsby in Northern Sydney that was was functional and could produce, um, you know, canned iced tea. Right. And then spent the next three months pulling in all family and friends, favors from everywhere, working 18 hours a day whilst still working at our jobs. Okay. Um, and, you know, basically produce the whole warehouse full of, full of canned iced tea, naturally sugar-free, without a customer. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know, you talk about chucking yourself in the deep end. Yeah. That's absolutely believing in what we're doing and then believing we can go out there and, and the opportunity exists. So. so you had your production facility, you had your factory full of goods, then you had to sell it. We then did. That must have been a tough part of the business. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, I think... You know, jumping on the road, knocking on doors, and and hearing firsthand from um, you know owners of retail outlets and and customers about what they thought about the brand was incredibly powerful because that was our very first you know product that we brought to market, right. and um, it was never going to be perfect. So hearing that feedback and understanding where we should go next and where we should take the, the portfolio was was a really important stage of the business. So that feed, I, I've heard to a story how a customer let you know that they'd lost 15 kilos by switching into next bar products away from soft drinks. Yeah, that's right. Yep. That's the sort of story that gave you the confidence to keep pushing? Yeah, I think um, you know the, the whole next bar proposition is our, our products are naturally sugar-free. Um, so we, in 2015, um, developed a... a a blend of natural sweeteners, which is now patented globally. Um, and it allowed us to create a whole range of soft drinks, sparkling waters, um, kombuchas, functional beverages that were naturally sugar-free. So hearing stories when people approach us um, on social media, give us a call or email us and let us know that, you know, what you what you what you guys have created has a real impact on my life. And, and in that instance, um, that person lost 15 kilos from, from just making the simple switch of a full sugar soft drink into our naturally sugar-free Nexpa products, um, absolutely, it gives you the confidence to say, you know, we're on the right path here. Um, what we're doing is having an impact and is making a difference. And, you know, it, 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 we absolutely are committed to completing this journey and, and continuing to, to on the path we're on. And you're close. Next bar will make a profit next year. You know, we're, we've been in business coming up to 10 years um, and... We've invested heavily throughout that process in, in our portfolio, um, in our people, um, and it's you know not until yeah I guess FY twenty that we'll turn our first profit, which is really exciting for us. Um, you know it's it's um, something that is a really big milestone, but also something which shows us that you know for the last nine years of business, the investment we've been making into into um, product innovation marketing is starting to really pay off. Right, but it's not the money that kept you going. If it was the money, we would have been out five years ago. So, um, you know, we, we are so passionate about what we're trying to create. Right. Um, we are so passionate about genuinely making an impact and having a difference in people's lives um, with particular interest in diabetes and obesity. Um, and a stat that I heard really on that diabetes is the sixth highest cause of death in Australia is mind-boggling. And, you know, a major cause of diabetes is all these high sugar soft drinks that we have in the market um so we we felt compelled and we felt that we had a really an obligation to create something which was going to give an alternative 
to, to those people and, and have a better impact on the wider health of the community. I mean, you're obviously a very positive person, Drew, right? Tell me about the tough times. Tell me, did you have any long, dark nights of the soul? You know, in, in the last nine years, there have absolutely been times where um, you, you're down to your last $20 or you have um, a major, major invoice coming in for, for goods that you, you can't see how you're going to pay that and you don't have the money in your bank account. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, in the last two years in particular, um, there's been times when you're not sure how you're going to get to the next stage of the business. Um, and, you, and, you, and you're staring down the barrel of a significant debt if the business was to fall apart because at the end of the day, being the director of the company, um, obviously the debts fall on you if, if the business was to go under. Um, I think to get through those stages, you have to remain positive. Um, you have to be passionate about the cause that you're trying to achieve and, and be passionate about the business and, and the direction of the business. Um, there's no doubt that having a business partner that I have in Troy as well and and the ability for up both of us to, um, you know, you can't be up all the time. So, and, and sometimes you got to rely on the other person to, okay. to, to bring you back up. Um, and then, you know, as well as that, having a, having a fantastic family, beautiful wife who's incredibly supportive, um, a wider family as well, which was supported throughout the whole journey is such a crucial element. That foundation gives you the confidence to keep going. I think without that, um, yeah, it'd be very tough to kind of just continue to take all the blows yourself and, and not be able to share that and, and look after your mental health as well. You took on the giants. I mean, you're taking on people like Coca-Cola yep. in this space. Yeah. Was that foolish? I think it's, you know, looking at it now, it's a bit of a David versus, versus Goliath type story. Um, what we wanted to do was be everything that they weren't. So we, right. we wanted to be... Um, the naturally sugar-free brand. When you look at the the behemoths of the multinationals, you know they are still full of sugar. They or, or artificial sweeteners. So um, that naturally sugar-free space was something we wanted to invent. We wanted to completely invent another category of beverages. Um, so in our view, we weren't actually trying to take on, you know, the Coca Colas and the Pepsis of the world. No. Um, we're actually trying to recreate what people drink as beverages and give them the opportunity, you know, take really take advantage of the, the anti-sugar sentiment that's, that's uh, happening. Um, you know, give people an option when they have diabetes or obesity, give them that natural sugar free option that didn't exist in the beverage world. So we wanted to create something that, that they weren't and everything that they weren't. Um, and I think that's where we're carving out um, our niche, which is now turning into a mass market product. Right. So you, you're often described as a disruptor, but yep. in essence, you're trying to help people find what it was they were looking for anyway. Yeah. And, and um, like everything, this is a 10 year overnight success, right? So it's, <laughs> yes. um, you know, formulating that strategy is, is taking a really long time. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're certainly on the, on the track of, of that really nice little sweet spot of um, getting a loyal consumer, which is fiercely passionate about Nexbar, um, which is actually now creeping into the mass market. So what's next for Nexbar? Um, a lot of exciting stuff. So we, um, domestically is is our core business and we're, we're really passionate about continuing to expand that beverage portfolio. Um, we're also looking at, you know, snacking and naturally sugar-free snacking and the functional space as well. So. Um, I think we'll see in the next 12 months, Nexper enter, um, you know, maybe the, the um, functional protein ball space or different things like that, yeah. um, which would be really exciting. But, you know, I think that there's, Australia is quite a small market um, and we actually entered the UK about 12 months ago and, and have had a hugely um, positive response to that. So that market for us will grow significantly over the next sort of, you know, one to two years. We launched over with a major retailer over there with our sparkling water range, um, and it's taken off really well. And, and um, that whole portfolio over there will sort of triple in the next 12 months. So, um, you know, really exciting global expansion um, and really focused on on continuing to develop that um, household penetration and brand awareness in the domestic market as well. Drew, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences and insights with the Artful Trader podcast audience today. Perfect. Thanks for having me, Mike. 
And now it's my pleasure to introduce Oleg Vornik, the CEO of Drone Shield. Oleg, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. You haven't always been in the defence industry, Oleg. You've got a background in investment banking. You work with ABN, RBC. You work with Brookfield Asset Management. You work with Leighton. Uh, you've had uh, many different paths to where you are today. And in fact, even at Drone Shield, you didn't start as CEO, you started as a CFO. That's right. How do you find this stepping up to the CEO role? I think there is a major difference between being a CFO of a business and being the CEO. That said, in a small company, perhaps the difference tends to blend a bit more here and there. So there are different types of CFOs in different companies, even in, in the public space, where naturally some tend to be more project management oriented, almost blending in the chief operating officer space. So that's kind of what I was from day one in any case, where you start to flow into the sales side of things, into even product development side of things. So for me, the step was probably a little easier. But look, I mean, being a CEO, you're fundamentally in charge of every major stream of the company. So you are looking after the technology side of things, after the sales side of things, uh, being a public company, after the relations side of investor relations side of things. So you basically have to be good at all of those. Now, you are assisted by your team and every one of them, but at the end of the day, uh, your name is uh, what what people see and how they react. Right. The buck stops with you. That's right. Before you started with Drone Shield, you were a frustrated investment banker who'd been in the industry too long. What was going on for you then? Well, I have to say that investment banking was very different pre-GFC and post-GFC in the sense that uh, the environment was different, the volume of things, uh, volume of deals was quite different, uh, teams were different. So the industry has fundamentally changed uh, from GFC onwards. And also perhaps what tends to happen is a lot of people uh, go through more junior roles within the banks and you get amazing talent uh, that that goes there and you form great relationships with people and you learn great skills. But it does take a very particular kind of person to remain uh, within the walls of investment banks into your senior career. And I don't think I was one of those people. So over time, I started to think, well, what else can I do where every day I get up energized and, and I want to move on with my day? And, and right now, I'm certainly at that point. Drone Shield has about 35 employees, is that right? That's correct. So that's not a large company, and yet Drone Shield punches well above its weight. We certainly do. So a lot of it, and that's one of the things I learned from investment banking, is team is critical. So every one of our people are consistently good. So right across the teams, from the engineers to our sales guys, uh, to uh, the rest of, of the crew. You leverage as much as you can. So today we're present in about 70 countries around the world, mostly three in-country partners. So we do have our own offices in, in the three key countries, being US, UK, and Australia, of course. But then a lot of other places, like for example, you look at Saudi, you look at French, uh, France, you look at uh, Colombia. Uh, we don't necessarily have the relationships, speak the language, or know how to do the business. So we rely on experienced representatives who work with us on effectively success only basis as our in-country agents and then we train them we go together and do demonstrations to various customers they have militaries law enforcement etc and they become our force multiplier so a lot of it is about leverage and basically making sure that you build a business in a way that you get exposed to a lot of customers um, the other thing that came a lot into our favor is we caught the momentum on number of fronts so the Defense industry in Australia is very much a new thing. It hasn't always been that case. So if you look at maybe 10 years ago, there was really not as much focus on buying Australian developed, Australian built defense products. And now from about two or three years ago, Australian government is undertaking a major focus on building up uh, domestic industry, both from the export point of view and also for uh, use by the Australian military and, and law enforcement. So we uh, very much experience the benefits of that. So whether you get taken around the world uh, with support of defense attaches, Australia, etc., um, you know, for example, you speak with the French uh, and a very easy conversation to have as well. Australia buys a whole lot of things like the French submarines, attack helicopters, etc. And also on the other end of it is counter drone industry itself. So when we started five years ago, people were saying, well, what are you guys doing? 
nobody can actually do anything bad with drones to start with. A drone can fly 50 meters smack against the nearest tree and that'll be the end <laughs> of the drone. So you couldn't do anything bad with it even if you were uh, um, you know, a, an ill-intending terrorist. But we said, just, just, just wait. Things are going to change as every technology drones were going to get better. Uh, payloads going to get better. Flying distances, batteries, navigation, etc. And sure enough, all of that happened. Uh, swarms of drones. So probably about three years ago, we started seeing terrorists uh, deploying drones in the Middle East to inflict uh, terrorist attacks. We started seeing people disrupting airport flights, so Gatwick most famously last year, but now we're seeing drone attacks or flights around airports almost on a weekly basis disrupting flight. And you may ask, well, why Why is it such a big issue? The reason for that, if a drone gets sucked, we're talking about small consumer drone, that's what we deal with, right. uh, get sucked into an engine of a plane, while engines of planes got built to withstand bird strikes, uh, they're not so good at plastic objects with lithium-ion batteries inside of them, so that can cause blowout of the engine and take down the airplane. So today, if an airplane sees a drone approaching into its territory, it just holds all planes, uh, you imagine inconvenience, the cost, etc. So we're working with customers like that to effectively make sure that these things don't happen. And the market is enormous. So part of the reason why we punch so much above our weight is we're very much going with those tailwinds of both Australian government support, uh, but also counter drone industry rapidly rising and us being there right from the start five years ago. So like many emerging technologies, drones have been used for evil as well as good. Uh, and as you rightly point out, that um, some people are using drones to disrupt you're disrupting the disruptors. That's great. So we often see ourselves as an antivirus almost kind of approach right. where with all the good applications of drones, like you said, there's all the negative applications and drones themselves evolve all the time. So new communication protocols come around all the time. Uh, drones get smaller or faster. You think of racing drones, uh, the payloads get better, distances get stronger uh, or larger. So with all of that in mind, we have to constantly refine our technology. So at the heart um, of our team is a couple dozen engineers who are basically constantly working to uh, continue refining those technologies and make sure that we stay in front of uh, the developments of drones as they happen. And what gives you the confidence that you'll be able to stay ahead of those threats that, that people want to deal with with Drone Shield? It's a good question. So we have very much been successful with it up to now. We see the quality of our team. And one thing that I have to say is that in Australia, you get the quality of both engineering talent and sales talent, which is world class. Uh, so I just spent two years living in the U.S. and I've seen a lot there. And, and U.S. is a little bit like in the defense, a bit like in acting the you know, world capital of the industry. And still very much so in Australia, we see similar, if not better, talent as we're seeing there. So I look at the world class standard of our team. I look at all the success we've done. And with that, uh, is the confidence that we'll continue pushing forward. So in 2016, you brought Drone Shield to the share market. You, you launched an, an initial public offering and became a public company. What did that mean for Drone Shield and what did it mean for you personally? Sure. Look, great thing about being public when you're dealing with government customers, which is majority of our customers for a number of reasons, is you get high profile. So uh, in a lot of cases, assessing the company itself or assessing the manufacturer is a very big part of the assessment, not just the products for the customer. And being a high profile public company certainly helps our sales, helps approach towards the customers because we're definitely seen as more credible than perhaps similar size, similar profile company, but that'll be privately held. Um, and it certainly helps the marketing. Um, look, I think our kind of technology is great for public markets because it's relatively easy to put out interesting things that people intuitively understand. I think the issue with defense industry generally is that due to uh, nature of the products, due to the nature of the customers, there's not a lot that you can productively put out and educate investors with, which is also why I think a lot of these companies are not public. But I think Counter Drone is a bit of an excep exception where there's enough that you can put out so people get their heads around what you do, how big the opportunity is, why, uh, and why it's so exciting, all the growth ahead. Uh, for me personally, Look, it certainly means high profile, um, but look, over time you you get used to it, and and in some ways again it helps sales. Um, you know, you go to some pretty high profile customers, and they're like, "Drone Shield, you're famous. We, we heard of you." So, being willing to experiment and try new things 
must mean that as well as success as there are failures, and in fact you've been quoted as saying, Ollie, and I do hesitate to bring this up, but you've been quoted as saying that you don't necessarily know the right way to run a business, but you know a hundred wrong ways to run a business. Sure, I think I might have called a thousand wrong ways to run a business, <laughs> there, are, there are many. Uh, look, we had a lot of successes so far, and I, I'm very happy with the way business is traveling right now. But that said, I think there's nature, a lot of experimentation uh, that goes with, with running the business. Uh, so you're looking at the nascent industry, uh, nascent, uh, for, for a lot of customers, when they buy products from us, this is the very first time they ever buy this kind of product. Right. So in terms of the go-to-market strategy, in terms of building the technology itself, it's inevitable you try a whole lot of things and some things work and some things don't. Uh, and you, you just have to do this. So whether it means um, appointing new agents in the country and then uh, swapping them, and there are some places where we had spectacular good agents from uh, from the get-go, and we're really happy about that. But then we also had cases where we had to change multiple in-country agents because for whatever reason, they were just not doing what we're expecting of them to do. Um, and look, similar thing with tech. So some products become widely more popular than others. Um, over time, you can get a little better at predicting what the customers want. Uh, right now, we're very fortunate in that most of the new products we bring to market are in response to the end customer demand, where you basically don't bring the product to market until you get customers to say, okay, well, here is specifically what I want. And also when you refine the product, uh, in the beginning, we used to think, okay, well, what could be things that the customer could possibly want? And a lot of that led to trial and error. Uh, now things are becoming a lot more refined where customers tend to adopt you again, they trust and they say, okay, well, this is great, but I want this switch in this way, this design in that way. Uh, so your, um, I guess, error making starts to reduce and you become more and more on point with, with the customers. Okay, but certainly at least in the early days, you factored failure into your business model. Was it ever discouraging? Look, I have a very understanding uh, board and a uh, great chairman, Peter James, who chairs a number of large and smaller companies, and I have a great relationship with him. So thing about failure is that you have to be in the environment that is uh, supportive of you experimenting and trying things. Uh, so both from perspective of the team uh, and, and from the board and from the investors, uh, I was very fortunate in the ability to try a whole lot of things. Now, that said, the idea is that you try a whole lot, but you need to have enough success for the business to continue moving forward and evolving. Uh, right. so There must be a balance. So, so the, the balance has to be net positive, even right. if some things don't work out as, as much as you would like them to be. Does intuition play any role in, in your continuous experimentation? I think it certainly does, but there's a question, well, how, how do you see intuition? Uh, so I think, to me, intuition is subconsciously absorbing a lot of things that you've seen in the past. So once you see a lot, you kind of start making connections between things. Uh, so for example, when you when you look at the product and you think what could be the features and you look at different customers who suggest different things, you reflect on the situations like that in the past. Um, when you have different in-country agents who want to represent you and you basically want to make a decision which one you want to go with and you assess them based on your discussions with them, again, you reflect back in the past and think what has worked and what hasn't. So. I think intuition as in decision making under uncertainty kind of happens all the time, uh, but... Traders are very familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but I think in, in many ways, it's just a product of your brain making connections between how the current situation um, related to what you've seen in the past and just kind of extrapolating um, from that. Uh, I was once told to never... Uh, confuse smarts with experience uh, as it's a slightly different ways of uh, making right judgments but the idea is that um, as you whether you can or cannot build smarts is a separate thing but as you get more experience uh, you certainly judge better based on reflecting on similar things in the past. Oleg, thank you very much for being part of the Artful Trader today. Thank you Mike. That's the end of part one of our Disruptor Special. But make sure you tune into the next episode of The Artful Trader as we bring our three disruptors into conversation together and unpack how confidence can turn an idea into a thriving business.